from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and welcome to my glamorous hotel room in Derby, I'm in the East Midlands, where I did watch some history though, as Sri Lanka's women led by Chamri Atapattu beat England in a series for the very first time. They won a T20 series here, having also walloped England in Chelmsford, one of the poorest matches I've seen an England women's team play, that's for sure. But Sri Lanka and Atapattu, they were very good in the field. Uh, they did everything right and they marmalised England. So it was a delight to see from that perspective of some history being made. And England, well, they haven't lost a series to anybody except Australia since 2010. So it was quite remarkable. And maybe we, we will see some sand shifting uh, in terms of women's cricket and hopefully more investment in the Sri Lankan women's team and the setup in particular. Very good. Great news for Sri Lanka and um, England just they keep being in the news somehow, I suppose. But as uh, far as the Aussies are concerned, they've had a good time in South Africa with the um, frolic of T20 and Mitch Marsh's uh, strong leadership and his powerful batting. So we'll see if that continues as we go into the uh, um, 50 over games over there. But it's, uh, it's obviously warming up because it's 28 degrees in Sydney. So well, we're, we're getting close to the cricket season here. Well, let's not talk about temperatures. I'm in Dubai. It's very hot. <laughs> <laughs> so is it in the other nations where the Asia Cup is being played? But of course, I'm you know here for the Asia Cup and uh, today is an off day, but it's been good and bad. We've seen some very good matches. The India, of course, haven't really played a big match yet because the match with Pakistan got rained out. We'll have more chat on the Asia Cup a little later. And of course, we're into the final four now where all the four tough teams are in. So if the weather remains OK in Colombo, where the rest of the matches are now going to be played, I think it's going to be quite a cracker of a tournament. I must thank my hosts here. Uh, the two stations that I am uh, commenting for are called Big and Talk. Maybe it figures. <laughs> Lots of talking to be done, Sherry. Starting here because we'll kick off with, well, we'll talk about the Asia Cup, but I do want to start off with India's squad for the World Cup, that provisional squad that's been named. Um, India, the hosts, of course, looking to win the trophy that they last lifted memorably back in 2011, uh, the year they last hosted the event as well. It could be an omen. Uh, Kale Rahul, Charu, a big name included, even though he hasn't played a competitive match since May due to a thigh injury. A uh, few players competing in the Asian Games, uh, perhaps disappointed to miss out. Um, first of all, what did you make about Rahul's inclusion? Well, it is a strange one, I must admit, because he hasn't played too much. And of course, the last few matches, he hasn't exactly starred. But the kind of reputation he has and the classic manner in which he makes his runs, very pleasing batsman to watch. I just, you know, every once in a while, reputation does count in perhaps Asia, certainly India, where if you might remember, Kohli went through a really bad patch for three years and he was still a part of whichever team he wanted to be. I don't think it's such a bad inclusion, but why include somebody like KL Rahul if you want to play him? So his position is a bit of a problem right now because Ishan Kishan, the other batting all-rounder as in a wicket keeper, is also cementing his place. So I'm not upset with that inclusion. A lot of people may be because he hasn't played well and he's become some sort of a, <laughs> a, a, a social media bunny where people love to criticize him. I don't know why, you know, it's one of those strange things as well. But, you know, if he does get going, He's a match winner. And I'm not too fussed about his inclusion. I think uh, if there's still time uh, till October and if he can get in a quick uh, couple of, um, I don't know, knock somewhere, not in the Asia Cup, uh, he, he might still be a decent bet. Or at worst, a very good reserve. What about those uh, unlucky perhaps to miss out, in your opinion? Well, as always, I think uh, Ravi Chandra Ashwin, very unlucky. Because especially in India... I'm not suggesting that the pitches will turn crazy, but, you know, he's a very valuable performer and, and a lion-hearted batsman as well. Uh, and a very tricky uh, offie because we don't have an off-spinner in, in India and very few teams do. So be the, the world's best off-spinner, if I can call him that, not playing the World Cup, he'll be upset as always. I mean, he's not given to any kind of rant or whatever. That's a big miss. I also think... Uh, Perhaps uh, Chahal uh, Yuzvendra might have been pushed in there because in India, he knows exactly where to bowl. He's a very clever bowler. He won't give you a good batting option, I admit. He's not the finest fielder. But as a bowler, if India needed one more spinner or two more, these two, I think, are the ones who have missed out. Jim, what about um, Australia? Because they've been preparing for the World Cup or getting warmed mm. up in South Africa. You mentioned the, the T20 series. They're very convincing in that one, 3-0. And yeah, Mitch Marsh shining as captain and they're now into the ODIs. Um, their provisional squad then for the World Cup, no surprises there really? 
Not at this point, no. We're about to have transition in Australian cricket in the next 12 months across, um, well, certainly test cricket and, and uh, one day cricket, but it's interesting. We don't, you know, don't play too much 50 over cricket. Mm. I mean, it's mostly guys who are, who are doing well with a white ball of T20 cricketers. Um, so I think it, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Australia's performance in India and uh, as Cherry mentioned there they will be relying on pumping out a lot of runs uh, because <clears throat> you're bowling you seems to me in India on a lot of flat surfaces that you get for um, one day cricket uh, you're bowling for the crowd most of the time um, in the hope that they'll take some catches because <laughs> that's where the ball's going to go an awful lot so um yeah I'm a bit wary with the Australian side at the moment. Um, I, I just things are getting a, a little edgy with blokes moving towards the back end of, of their careers. But it's, it's a very solid side and they should do well. Um, but the lack of 50 over cricket for everyone uh, is a little bit of a concern. Less for India because they're playing at home. I think that is a big factor that's, that helps them. Chari, what about the Asia Cup then? Because India would hope to lift that before they enter the, the 50 over World Cup proper. Um, but that India Pakistan big match we wanted to see, weather affected, we didn't get to see it. I mean, how frustrating was that? Oh, extremely, of course. It's given rise to a lot of controversy uh, amongst the fans of the two teams, where Pakistan fans do believe that they had India on the mat. And they did 60 for four or whatever it was before they recovered to 60 and change, which may or may not have been enough. We don't know. We can't find out because the Indians, of course, didn't get to ball. So, yes, lots of frustration there. And you might know the history of uh, the Asia Cup as well this time around because it was played, supposed to be played in uh, Pakistan. And India refused to go, so they had to shift the venue. And Pakistan left with only four matches. And uh, Sri Lanka with uh, 12 or so or nine plus more. So, yeah, I mean, I think Sri Lanka kind of just took that burden over. And we know that this is monsoon time. It's bound to be raining in most of South India or, or Colombo as well or uh, Sri Lanka. So it was somewhat expected. It has ruined the start of the Asia Cup. But now in the final four or the Super Four now, I think it's uh, all in Colombo. And hopefully they've got a much better Super Supper system in case it does rain. I do think uh, we can all look forward to a fabulous Final Four because you've got four very tough teams. India, Pakistan are playing again this weekend. And if uh, Destiny should have it, then they'll play again in the final later on, on the 17th. So there's plenty of India-Pakistan action that is still likely to come. And we'll find out who's better. Of course, Pakistan are world number one, India a little below that in terms of their ranking. But uh, both are very solid teams. Uh, the, the, the shining... Uh, the most uh, worthy of appreciation part of the Asia Cup so far is probably the Pakistan bowling, the fast bowling. They've been fabulous, uh, better than just about any other bowling lineup. And we'll see if that makes a big difference in the World Cup as well. But winning the Asia Cup, people are saying it's a preparation for the World Cup. I don't think so. It's got its own charm, its own aura. And in terms of belief and expectations, the team that wins the Asia Cup will, for fans in South Asia, become the favourite to win the World Cup. Tell you what, everyone, they'll be making sure that they are well across their Duckworth, Lewis, Stern and net run rates and all those technical <laughs> things after that calamity yeah. that Afghanistan had and they just oh, weren't across the net run rate calculations. Oh, oh, I know, I know. Oh. We won't dwell on that too much. It's too painful for, for the Afghanistan audience. Um, Jim, I mean, you and I, we've, we've all travelled to Sri Lanka. When you are playing cricket there in the rainy season, it is tough. I mean, they, they rode to the rescue of the tournament, didn't they, in order to host these matches to make sure the tournament went on. But ooh, it is the rainy season. It's always going to be difficult. Yes, it's a, it's a bit like trying to play, if you're taking the equivalent in, in Australia, of playing cricket in Darwin in the middle of our summer. I know that sounds absurd, but that's when it's wet up there. So that's why, historically, if you're playing cricket in the north of Australia, uh, you play in winter. Um, and uh, maybe more allowance needs to be made for these factors, which are pretty obvious to most people. But Charlie said they did have a, a problem in the first place with uh, Pakistan not being the available venue. Before we move on, I do want to mention the sad news that emanated out of Zimbabwe this week, and that was uh, the death of Heath Streak, uh, the former captain, the nation's highest wicket taker in both Test and One Day International cricket. He died from cancer, and he was just 49. Uh, some of Streak's career highlights included leading Zimbabwe at the 2003 World Cup and taking six for 87 in a test against England, which earned him a place on the Lord's Honours Board. Uh, since 2021, Streak had been serving a, an eight-year ban from cricket for corruption 
offences. Uh, but I just wanted to get your memories, Jim and Charry, briefly uh, about Heath Street. Jim, how, how will he be, be remembered uh, on a cricketing front? Passionate, powerful cricketer. A great influencer uh, with the ball, sometimes with the bat as well. Very strong man and uh, a strong belief in uh, making sure that Zimbabwe went about their cricket in the right way, which caused him to get into a few issues with the uh, government of the day. And um, sadly, on the back of that, he had this eight-year ban involved in this sort of alleged Bitcoin corruption, which I don't think he was strongly part of. But um, uh, sadly, he was he was blighted by it. And um, that uh, is reputational damage that you, you don't want. But he was always a, a, a terrific all-round cricketer, particularly his fast bowling and a, and, and a very powerful leader. And it's just a, such a shame, and, and, and hopefully it didn't contribute to his demise, but it may have uh, all the pressure that was on and around him with trying uh, to work a way, a pathway through uh, for Zimbabwe, which has been involved in some um, unpleasantness uh, through the need to have uh, the, the right team at a certain part of their history. And uh, at one stage, I think there were th 13 players uh, who pulled out of the side because of the edict uh, from those in charge about having um, a certain number of black players in the team. Um, it's all part of a, a horrible history. And the fact that Zimbabwe are at least still playing is is a bonus. But yeah, it's been a pretty messy 20 years. And unfortunately, Heat Street was caught up in the middle of, of all that. But we should not forget the outstanding contribution he made um, as a player and the leader, um, and it's sad that someone should go as soon as that at just the age of 49. Finally on Stumps, we're joined by a 16-year-old who's become the youngest player, male or female, to take 50 T20 international wickets. She's also the youngest cricketer to represent the United Arab Emirates in 50 women's T20 internationals, and she's currently with the UAE, competing in the T20 World Cup Asia qualifiers over in Malaysia. And her name is Veshnavi Mahesh, and she is with us now, a leg spinner as well. Veshnavi, welcome to Stumps. It's great to have you. First of all, just what was your immediate reaction when you found that you had you had broken this record you know, across all countries of the world? Oh, so I had uh, come from the innings break. I had come back from the innings break, and then my manager told us that I've broken the record. And immediately, I didn't know what to react and how to react because I was still processing that information that I've broken the record. It was later that evening that it started hitting me that, okay, I've broken a record. But then I was extremely happy about that. Tell us a bit more about uh, that debut, the age of, of 12. Uh, was that intimidating for you? How do I explain this? <laughs> I think I was very surprised that I was debuting for an international team at the age of 12. But uh, very li little did I know about uh, international games or how it works or what is the pressure that you go through in international cricket. Yeah, I think that was my first feeling when I came into the team. Role models. Which cricketers have inspired you so far? I can't name one or two. I think there are so many cricketers that have inspired me. Uh, I think like any other kid, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Virat Kohli, MS Dhoni. But then I think my role model would be uh, Rashid Khan in the men's cricket. And in women's cricket, I'm a huge, huge fan of Mitali Raj, Julan Goswami and uh, Amelia Kher. All right, let's move on to this incredible situation where I believe 10 of the UAE cricket team members, the, the, the women's team, are still teenagers. What's with this incredible sort of influx of youth into the team? What about the older cricketers? Where are they? I think there was one point where there were so many senior cricketers. And then I think, you know, age is something that increases gradually. You can't do anything about it. So I think they moved away. And uh, now it's a group of youngsters. And uh, the average age should be between 17 or 18 for the team. It's, it's quite a young team. It is a young team. I mean, you alluded to your own journey of debuting at 12, somewhat of a surprise. Just talk us through how you got to that point. At the age of uh, nine or 10, nine is when I actually started playing the game. 
with my dad uh, my dad used to play for the third division team in india i think i got it from him so i used to play with the plastic ball and bat with him and then i used to play badminton with my mom so there was uh, there was a confusion between which one i should take whether it was badminton or cricket <laughs> but then i think somehow the bat and ball attracted me more than what the racket did so that's how i took up the sport and at the age of 10 um there was a program that was organized by adcb called simply life where um, uh pre- uh cricketers former cricketers like hemang badani uh, vijay bharadwaj and uh, anil kumble sir had also come to watch one of the games which had taken place in dubai stadium so that is when they actually saw my talent and then they called my parents and said that i think she should really take up the game seriously and then we uh, we went to a very renowned coach in dubai uh, who groomed me and he was also the coach of the ua women's team then uh, we went to him uh, he was the one who groomed me and uh, got me into the team um, and the first time i was on tour my parents went and asked him are you sure she should be there because they had their doubts themselves uh, because i'm too young you know to travel alone and he mm. said we really want her to have the experience of the team and see how international cricket is and we're not just taking her there for for playing we're taking her there for the experience so that's how my debut started and you mentioned the pressure of suddenly playing for in, in an international team did you i mean looking back now do you think that 12 is too young should there be a minimum age or was the right environment there and and all the support like is it is it capable for for a 12 year old to soak up that kind of pressure well i think uh, currently icc has set up a rule saying that nobody before 15 can debut for an international team if i'm so right so that wouldn't happen anymore I, yeah that won't be happening anymore but then i think uh, I, we had uh, two three people who were at the age of 12 uh, in the team who were debuting when i debuted so i think that's that's a little too young to take up that pressure but then i, I think mm-hmm. we had our seniors who kept supporting us who kept giving us the confidence that you know we are here for you we're there to back you up anything any time we'll always be there for you so i think we were blessed to get the, those that kind of seniors what did you make of mahika moving to england and switching from the uae to represent england first things first we really really miss her here um i think <laughs> we miss her in the bunch we were a group of people who used to keep meeting in dubai and uh, we really really miss her here but at the same time we're extremely happy for what she has achieved and very very proud of her i think we can't i think i, I think we can't be more proud than this like we're extremely proud well vesnav it's been great to speak to you good luck then for all the rest of the qualifiers let's hope you get through to that global stage as well and congratulations on everything you've achieved at such a young age already thank you so much thanks a lot that is vesnav mahesh of the uae and that's all we've got time for on this week's stump so they say thanks to jim maxwell and charish sharma and to all of you make sure you join us again for more next week bye for now <laughs>